Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I am delighted to chat with J.D. Schramm. He has over 20 years of experience of teaching graduate level courses on communications at Stanford, at USC, at Columbia, at NYU. And he's written the book that allows you to really quickly capture all of the tuition fees that all those folks were paying. It's called Communication Was Mastery, Speak With Conviction, and Write for Impact. And why should you be focusing on this episode? Because JD helps clients prepare for little-known venues like Davos or TED Talks. He helps them secure their next route of funding. He helps you nail a job interview or win a pitch. JD, welcome to the pod. Alex, I am delighted to be here and look forward to this conversation today. Look, I have a misfortune that I missed you by a few years at Stanford and didn't get a chance to take your class, but I heard rave reviews. I actually have a question, secret question that came from somebody that just picked up ahead of the pod, but I'm just delighted to have you here because what you're focusing on is fundamental to our audience at Experience Focus Leaders and really fundamental to any leader that wants to be effective. And I think one of the topics that you brought up in the book and in your communications is that you're equating some of the issues related to leadership and communications. Do you want to deep dive into that a little bit? Absolutely, Alex. I have often found that when I'm brought into an organization or I'm working with an individual and I'm told they have a communication issue, almost always they also have a leadership issue. Or more likely, I'm brought in by a board or by HR or somebody. This individual has a leadership issue right beside that or right underneath that is a communication issue. If you're not able to communicate in a way that people will follow you, you're not able to lead effectively. So they are, they're different disciplines, they're different distinctions, but boy, they are meshed with each other. Great. And, and so when, when you think of a leader that historically has, you know, looked at something communications as some PR department, something like almost administrative, and you, in your book, you describe the history that it was not seen as a must have capability. But then when having lived in the Valley and taught at Stanford, that some of the most innovative companies, be it Google, be it Apple. And one of our advisors for my company is head of marketing communications at Apple, who brought in all of brought of those capabilities in-house. They see communications as a major strategic advantage, right? From leaders on downward. And even when I was at Salesforce, the bar for communicating and engaging with your audience was set very high. And some people were just literally being like, hey, you are you got to work on your delivery. We can't have you on Dreamforce on center <laughs> stage if you're not even if you're not captivating. And the slides that we were looking at, they were, we literally were using the best practices, reading books on how do you could imp- improve the communication. So some of these companies that are game changers, whether it's an enterprise software or even consumer things like Google, they dedicate a lot of attention to this topic. Why do you think it's not as prevalent, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe it is prevalent outside of the Valley? Oh, I think even here in the Valley, there are firms and individuals that do it really well. And there are those who still feel that effective communication is something I can delegate to others, or or it will happen as long as I build a great product. And then when we get wider outside the valley, there really is a variety of beliefs and respect for the field of being able to write and speak in a way that people follow you. And I think it's a holdover from top-down management where, you know, if I say we're going this direction, we go that direction. And yet that's not how our organizations and certainly not how our employees coming in in their 20s and 30s want to interact with an organization. They want to feel a sense of confidence in their leader and clarity and understanding of the vision and the direction and and where they're going to take the firm. Great. Actually, I want to use this opportunity to quote one of your speeches that stuck with me. 
And this is from one of your Stanford addresses where you said, if as a leader, you want to influence the direction of an organization or the output of your employees and your team members, the best tool in your toolkit as a leader is effective and clear communications. So that's a bold claim, right? Some people could say it's strategy. Some people could say it's know-how. Let's make a case for the clear and powerful communications. Why Why is, of all the other levers, right? Like why that's the one that will help you succeed. Even let's assume a very technical or scientific or other Mm -hmm. discipline. The underneath that communication, there has got to be some very clear and compelling content. So I don't want to diminish strategy or scientific endeavor or research. Like all of those are valuable for creating the content. But if as a leader, I can't then take that content and communicate it in a way that my audience wants to take the action that I need them to take, I I have failed. It's almost, if we take it out of the field of business, it's almost like a novelist who has a remarkable novel, but it's buried in their drawer. They've not shared it with anybody and they've not gotten anybody to read it and engage with it. Have they really made a difference by just writing that for themselves? And so as leaders, we need to be sure we can take a ton of information, more today than ever before, and deliver it in a way that that people will take action based on it. So to that kind of quote about Charter, that, that he, he mobilized the English language and put it to war. And what you're saying is you're mobilizing all that knowledge. You're mobilizing all the information. You are hopefully come up with insights, right? Because it's just effectively communicating bad ideas also is not necessarily a, a <laughs> break God's gift to the world, right? In a, in, a, in a sense of the world. But ideally, you have this great substance, and you're then translating that into a behavioral change for your audience. Absolutely. And, and I think if I can jump back and re-answer the question from a few minutes ago, part of the reason why it may not be as fully respected as it could be in the field, is we all have experienced people who were flashy, compelling communicators, but there was no substance under it. And I think that's what people are are scared about. If you start training them in storytelling and executive presence, am I going to lose that content? No, I actually have to start with that content and then make sure that's clear to the audiences I'm interacting with. Yeah, so I I think one of the bad things that happened to all of us is this light communications, right? Like I would say the fluff, the headline clickbait thing where people are taking the taking the art and science of communications and are overstimulating us, distracting us, but not necessarily delivering the substance underneath. In parallel, there's this almost a alignment that the more evidence driven you are the more scientific you are the more deep you are the the more important are your ideas the worse you are at communicating and so it's and i'm really just really curious if you you've observed that like you were at these great academic institutions did you find that like i would say you know average mba student probably is okay they needed to write an essay right to get in there they but I'm wondering about the average scientists or folks that are maybe just not as not as not as expected to be ef- effective. Are they struggling? And how, if so, how do you get them beyond like beyond just? Oh, of course, if my idea doesn't get understood, like it's a tragedy. But is there some other ways that you help them prioritize time to the communications of their notion of their ideas and insights? Well, there, there's a couple of things in there to, to unpack, Alex. First of all, I, I don't believe there are fields that the leaders in are necessarily worse at communication than others. I, I don't think it's a, a God-given gift. Some people have more talents than others, but I think it's something all of us can work on and all of us can build, whether we're an introvert, whether we're technically inclined, uh, whether we're scientifically inclined, all of us can build that skill. I think what happens is often in the training and the education, the demands to communicate to a wider audience aren't there. 
And so many of our physicians and scientists and great engineers haven't been expected to do that. And so they haven't built that muscle while they have been building their ability to research or to innovate or to code. And so when I'm brought in, often there is some low hanging fruit that with just a couple of sessions or a couple of conversations, if they begin to see the results of communicating in a way that, that people will engage with their ideas and take action, then they want to do more. They're like, okay, this is working. What else can I do? What else can I do? And where I focus initially with a client or with a team that I'm working with is let's just do the basics better. And let's be sure that we're getting our message across to the people we're engaging with. And then I can work on more nuanced elements of communication. And if a speaker begins to see results in what they're doing, if they start getting funded or they start getting second round or third round interviews, then they're willing to do more, but they need to see that it's working for them. Got it. So there's just... Talent is generally evenly spread, although we could probably see some industries draw people that care about communications more than others, but it's evenly spread. And what you're saying is the gaps generally tend to be just due to lack of experience and lack of exposure to best practices. Exactly. And I think we can all see inside of organizations where Somebody is promoted and they're very talented at their technical skill, but when they get to a certain level that they need to be able to lead and inspire a team of, some of my clients have hundreds of people that are reporting to them, that takes a different level of communication than getting a team of six people to agree on the priority of adding features to the site. Got it. One of the tools that I really love that you bring up in your book and the framework that's easy to adapt, and we're starting to use it in our organization, is AIM. And so let's discuss that because that feels like this is one of those things that's obvious once you hear it, but yet so few people, like you said, actually go do it. So I'm going to pull up an example of AIM here that we pulled together in your speaker club. And you could see it right here is some of the ideas from the book. Oh, maybe I didn't. Oh, maybe it's in the webinar. Just a second. So we're going to go into your speaker center. And yes, live podcasting screen sharing is, is on demand here. Here you go. There you go. So we have some, this is this framework, audience, intent, and message. And let's discover Let's dive into a little bit of how do we think about that? Absolutely. And there's, first of all, I love what you have done with my materials to make them uh, accessible to the people who will interact with it through your site and through your products. This is really nicely done. There's one item that's missing on this slide, and that's credit to the people who created it because it's not my own. This Mm -hmm. was created by Lynn Russell and Mary Munter. Uh, Lynn was at Columbia's Business School. Mary was at at, uh, the Tuck School at Dartmouth. But it is so effective because of its simplicity. I have to know who is my audience, what inspires them, what motivates them, what irritates them, what's going to get them to take action and lean in and listen or lean out and go into their phones. Knowing my audience and knowing my intent as a result of this communication What's the action I want them to take? Want them to fund or authorize or eliminate or hire? Like what, who am I book talking next to meeting. what's the action? Like book called, exactly. Book, yeah, exa- right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And when I'm clear on my audience, my intent, then and only then can I create the message. If I create the message without tailoring it to the audience or tied to the intent, that's where we have emails that we get and go, why was I copied on that? What well, I didn't need to see that information. Right. Or you see a speaker that just doesn't resonate with the audience because he, he didn't do the research ahead of time to really understand who was in the room. So I, anybody that I work with, and you can map this out on a whiteboard, you can spend a half day session, or you can do it on the back of an envelope and just, who am I talking to? What's my intent? And what's the key message I want to leave them with? And it is a starting point and it is so simple, but it is so effective to to develop a strategy for anything you're going to write or speak. 
let's apply it a little bit. Some of our audience is familiar with what we're doing at Relate to. You know, what and I want to be, let's dive into the message part in particular. Where does the channel of how you communicate something comes in, right? Because there's many channels available to us, right? Like you, you mentioned email, there's obviously more than, ever person, yeah. uh, more than ever before. It's a lot of complexity. And sometimes we create something and we just, we think of it as it was done for one channel, but then I often ends up being used across very many channels and people don't necessarily feel like they, they're leaving some of that optimization out there. So tell us where does the channel come in? Is it part of the message and how you get that message out in this framework, for example? Absolutely. So under message is both the the structure of the message, the content that I'm going to deliver, and the channel, how I'm going to deliver it. If I am interacting with, and I saw some great research on this from Ben Leff at Verisite, where they analyze different audiences and the channel in which they preferred to get to interact with customer service agents. And overwhelmingly, the audience that was over the age of 65, which I'm not disparaging as I get closer and closer Mm -hmm. to that age, wanted to talk live with a person over the phone where those who were in their 20s really wanted to text and did not mind texting with a bot. And so I can deliver the same information to different audiences based on a demographic like age, education, a variety of other areas. And I can choose the channel that is going to be most resonant and most effective for them. I will text a lot with my 25-year-old son, but I know he's never going to see emails. So why even bother sending him an email? Why choose a channel that is not something he interacts with? Great. So if we dive into that, if we deep dive into that, you're basically supporting that really famous Uh, book and quote, the medium is the message, right? So the channel does influence the message, obviously, and vice versa, the message and the, you know, and all the things that come before it, like the audience intent does influence the channel that you're going to be using to deliver it. We have a view that in like almost the next step on that is the experience of that medium, so to speak, and the message. So we like to use this expression, experience is the message. So (laughs) if you're telling me that you're innovative, but you're sending me a fax, your PDF, right? That's the equivalent of that. And I'm expecting something innovative, right? Because you're talking about digital transformation and analog type of mediums or V1 of digital mediums are not signaling, they're not aligning, they're incongruent from there. So for us, we see like this, especially as it comes to digital and one really creating compelling one-to-one that are more complex and one-to-many that are maybe in the virtual virtual setting that you can't just deliver in person, there, this, there's a misalignment with the way many particular B2B folks communicate today and what they want that imp- impression be that they leave. Have you seen something similar in your world? And like, how do you, how does this framework help you spot these incongruencies? I, I love your phrase, the experience is the message. I think that is really insightful. And I really believe COVID did a great deal to reinforce that our experience of communication is a part of our experience of the message. So, for example, my husband is a minister, and his church not only made it through COVID, they thrived through COVID because they figured out a way to make that experience work for people, whether they were in the building six feet apart with a mask on, or they were at home experiencing it on Zoom, or they were watching it the week after on YouTube. And you want to think about each of those experiences How do I make this the best for the people who step into the room? How do I make this the best for the people who are live with me, but live via a a, a medium? And then how do I make the digital record later useful? And Mm -hmm. part of what you're already doing in terms of chunking those videos later, guiding people to the exact right place where they want to get the information they're going to receive. I think we're seeing some organizations be really innovative about what that digital experience is like 
and that it be different, but as valuable as that in-person experience. When groups don't think about this, I'm particularly thinking of a, a team meeting where we bring one person in by Zoom and they're like huge in the end of the conference room. They have an eight foot or six foot head and all of a sudden they're overwhelming the room or everybody in the room's having a conversation and the people uh, dialing in by phone or dialing by Zoom can't get into the conversation because they're second class citizens. And so you really got to think through how do I make the experience as effective as possible for the people who are joining us? And sometimes with that, you may choose to eliminate a method. You may say, this is only available uh, by logging into our Zoom, or this is going to be an event that's in-person only, it's not recorded, the only way to get the information is to show up, or you're going to create multiple media, multiple channels, but that's more complicated for you as a leader. Yes, and I think this is um, fundamentally where what we see is the kind of the communication channels and the preference learning styles have been something that people talked about in the past. So, and every copywriter knows that you need to use visual language to get people who are more visual. You need to use you so use words like picture this and and for the and the speakers also do that right and then listen here right so that's for the auditory and get this touch this right so we've got all these learning styles and we're trying to since we rarely control in the mid to large audience all the styles so we're trying to create this range of language that engages everybody I feel like that's think that thinking is pretty good for speech writers and pretty good for the copy. But in terms of visual, visual kind of digital communications, I don't think we were that sophisticated yet in that world. I don't know what you've been observing. Like I think it, it's done really well, maybe on the your corporate website. You hire an agency and they go think about all the stuff. But like back to some of the more important ideas. They're just, people don't really think that through. Starting from the fact that I get one big document or one big presentation regarding of who I am, right? Like I could be a very technical person that just needs to get to one particular component and I need to go through 200 pages like that on my phone to find that thing. Or I could be the CEO and I just need a high level introduction for my fellow CEO, either on a one pager or as an audio video snippet, like of them, like introducing the thing. And I'm like, and then I drill in, in the areas that I'm interested in. So th there's a big content typically has multiple audiences. And so from the very start, we create these monolithic experiences that yeah. don't allow us to then address the fact that there are multiple audiences. So how do you deal with this? Because your framework says there's audience right and i think yeah. most of the time we just think of one not very very rarely do people start saying how do i combine everything for everybody and you've got to measure this against the size of your team the amount of time you have the the stakes of the presentation but what i will often do is is have a group think through wh who are the key decision makers who, who are going to drive the action that you need? And then who are the influencers for those decision makers? And then who else needs to be informed? If in that group of who else needs to be informed, I, I want to have a, a TikTok version or a PDF version or a printed book because that's what that's great. But let's think about that decision maker. What's the way that she needs to see the information so that she can make that decision? and really think through that, that, that person as audience. And then who is she going to listen to? Who are the influencers around her? And how do they need to receive the information? Maybe the influencers around her need a, a 20 slide deck with all the background and all the research. And she needs a three slide executive summary, but needs to be able to ask people about the other parts of it. So it, it takes more time. But if it's a high stakes meeting, if it's a high stakes decision that's being made, you are, it is worth spending the time to maybe create multiple versions or, or two or three different channels that you can put it through so that you make sure you get the, the decision you need. 
but be careful to not go crazy with, we've got all of these tools available to us. I don't need to make 20 versions right. of my slide deck on changes in the policy for travel and expenses. No, maybe one or two ways to get that out to the people that need to see it. Yeah. So you bring up changes in the policy or travel and expenses or something like, let's stick to the high stakes use cases, because I think if you're, yeah. if you care about experience, it's probably high stakes, right? Like in basic collaboration is not like with one other person, you could get that done yeah. multiple ways. So high stakes, we divide them into two worlds. One is large audience and frequency maybe of that, right? Like of that communication. And then I would put high value, right? Like our corporate strategy, our annual report, our like sales presentation that gets pitched in every first meeting, interactive demo we want people to capture from websites, et cetera. These are things that we think are yeah, high see. value, high volume type of things, generally some combination of that, right? Like it's a two, it's almost a multiplier effect. And so for those, you typically, there are different audiences, right? Like a, a sales pitch, you just can't control. Like if you have Already two people in the meeting, they already may ask different questions. And sometimes you have a lot more. And sometimes the, yes, you're right, this person is more important, but you don't know who is the influencer. And you want to show that you're prepared. You want to show that you've got, you've thought this through. You want to show that there is evidence behind this scientific paper. But at the same time, you can't overload everybody with all that at once, right? And there are ways to personalize this, right? So, so people are taking an approach and say, okay, I'm going to put this thing in the AI and it's going to give me an answer like that I have a question. And right, this is interesting. And I think it's it, there's some value to this, but it doesn't give you the context. It doesn't right. give you, right. all right, here's a structure because our brains, some people's brains are still like, hey, I still need to know the, like, where does this apply? And so I could maybe like you saw, I had like navigation. I could jump around and go to the things that I'm used to, some kind of a decision tree that's really easy for people um, to navigate. So my question to you is, what are you seeing there to the, the best communicators are doing to create the sense of we are complete and we have thought about everything? But we're not going to overwhelm you with everything. We're not going to put you in the monologue of a document or monologue of a 15-hour event of speeches. We're going to help you pick your own adventures, get, get to the snippets that you care about, and then you can dive in and build trust that way. This is core to our DNA and what our clients are discovering. But I'm curious, almost like, why haven't more people thought about this and tried to do it? Because it just makes sense. Uh, to allow both the credibility and the discover your own adventure mode uh, as a way of kind of engaging people? I think, first of all, I think you're absolutely right. That is the goal we should all have with our communication. I think the necessary first step is to have done that complete prep, to have that business model fully evolved or have that strategy document buttoned up that these are the four priorities for the next year. And you've got alignment around that before you start trying to communicate. You're not taking something half-baked out there. But because we get very invested in the creating of that strategy or that business plan, when we're asked to present on it, we want to show everything that we have done. And that's more about me and the work that I've done to be ready rather than my audience and what it is that they need to hear. And it, it takes a shift. So it's an ego. To be able what to you're saying, it's an ego. That, it's an yeah, ego. It, it's an ego. It's Look a, at all the work that I've done. Or if we're a consulting firm and I need the analysts that slave their, themselves away in that PowerPoint to feel that their slide is somewhere in there. And yeah. I need that. Is that kind of... That definitely plays into it. That definitely yeah. plays into it. But if I can just shift from... What's the information I want to share to what's the information they need to hear? That's where I will be more successful. And yeah, that one slide may not get shown, or it, it may be in the appendix and the handout that doesn't get the spotlight because that wasn't necessary for that particular audience. And being flexible and comfortable with that 
rather than overwhelming your audience with everything that you've done, uh, your audience will be more appreciative and you'll end up being more successful with the asks that you have of people. So I think what, what you're describing is easier to accomplish if you're having a conversation, right? Because you can't just really have a conversation that's total one way, especially like one-to-one, -one, right? Like we can go, you ask questions, we re-clarify. It's, it's easy to get trapped in a monologue, like and a monologue could be verbal speech or here's a you know document monologue or even we're both fans of the, the slide docs but even the slide doc without an easy way to get to the parts that you care about is a it's it could be monologue you just more a little bit visual so the worry that i have is that this clarity of communication that you're describing right like i sometimes it happens in conversations Sometimes it happens and really, like, really think this through in a one-to-many thing. But the bulk of these high-value documents and speeches and whatnot, they're still a little bit linear. And so sometimes you get it right and you really nail the linear thing. But in my experience, if you're a client, like if you have complex, complex product portfolio or if your solution has multiple value proposition for multiple personas... You just can't guess. You can try. You could hope the AI does it for you. But nine times out of 10, I think you could have a good hypothesis and then let the other person choose. Where do you want to go take this, right? Like, here's three ways we help somebody like you. Does this sound resonates? Let's double click here. Everything. This double click doesn't, it feels like people don't get it. Like, they still operate on a little bit of a one-time bespoke thing and less double clicking or are you seeing a change in this sort of we'll give you some choices and you go, we'll take this conversation down the path that that we like i think that there's a range but i think some of the most effective communicators are used to this flexibility in terms of what i need to cover with this particular audience i'm prepared for a through z but in this audience, it's really just J and L and Q and M that I need to spend time on. And I don't hate the fact that I prepared 22 other things. I'm delighted that I was prepared for what it was that, that we needed to have the conversation about. There's a tactic here that we haven't talked about, and that's the power of the meeting before the meeting and the meeting after the meeting. In the meeting itself, I may have 10 minutes to run through a few slides and answer questions. But in the prep for that, if my gatekeeper, my advocate, my ally has given me, these are the things you need to be ready for. This is what you've got to be you know, in tune to. If you hear this, you need to know this is what it means. And so the prep that I do, audience analysis, going back to AIM, and then it's what I do after the meeting. If I can very quickly get a short email back to the person and say, you asked about this point this blog talks about this or this video goes into that. Right. I sent something to my students from USC last night. I sent them this morning. I said, here's the TED talk I referenced. At eight minutes is the analogy that I used in class if you want more depth on it. So I not only gave them the video, I gave them the timestamp in the video they needed to go to to make it easy for them to take the next step. If I take a week to get that follow-up email done, or I do a follow-up email with 23 attachments and links to it, I'm not going to have the same impact as I do something quick, tailored, and specific to what you asked about. And that's hard for me, but that's where I see my most effectiveness is when I show that I was listening and I get you the information that you need. Yeah, I think what way we're seeing AI work is that it reads you, right? And I think what you're describing is still, I would say, manual meeting process. I think... In B2B Agreed. world, we're seeing that, unfortunately, you don't have a chance for a pre-meeting, you don't have a chance for a meeting, and you don't have a chance for post-meeting. By the time people will already have a very strong perception of what your solution does and what it could do for them, just based on going through your site or hearing your solution described. And so if you have, if you're ready for that, with what you're describing as these sort of best practices of best communicators that allow you to address different stakeholders 
right? Have an intent. What's an intent? Like book a meeting with a sales rep. Let's not wait for that call to action to be on the last page of an 80 page ebook, unclickable, which is, or like a presentation (laughs) that people put up there and say, thank you on the last slide. And then write their something or other, like in a very way that's not scannable, not clickable, not something. And then you see this, they're like, the point of this presentation was for people to connect with you, right? Like, the, like, why is this intent all the way back? We're not even there. And it's just, it feels like a tragedy that a lost you know, as we move into this virtual post, especially post COVID world, where more and more is happening, where you're not in the room, you're not in the Zoom you're like there towards the end of something that they're trying to do. We're we're missing the chances to inspire and engage our audience to move forward. And and I think both can exist. I, I completely agree with you that my example has a level of manual task to it. But I think the the best AI produced solution will only be made better if I'm able as a leader to put my imprint on it and personalize it and tailor for my audience the pieces that they need to know. And so I wouldn't, wherever possible, I wouldn't rely just on that. I would look and see, okay, that's a great, that's a great starter soup. Now what's the seasoning that only JD or only Alex could bring to the mix? And that's where we establish connection with people. Yeah, and, and I really like your metaphor as well, just to build it on, on, on that connection and the easy follow-up. So given that there's so much noise, then this last step of the message needs to be competitive in a very noisy market, right? And that's where yeah. the, I, I feel like that I still have a thesis that the scientific people, the kind of, they are not that competitive um, because their world is heavy, substantive, etc. But then at the same time, their audience is maybe partially lives in this world, but partially lives in the world of Instagram. And like very visual, very easy, very snackable, frankly, let's call it fast food type of content at times. And it's hard to compete. So what you described as like sending 20 attachments, right, is a great example we see this as a kind of real problem, right? Because I want to be following up with you, right? And I want to make sure that you've heard. But if my method is to say, here's a PDF number one, and you can go to page 24 there. And here's PDF number two, and you could go to page 50 there. And here's a video, let's file or YouTube, but let's say, like, let's hope it's YouTube. And then you try to like, there's a spot here, a spot there. And so you're creating, this is a lot of work, right? I have to go cl- download this thing, get to that page. Now imagine the world where you have a thumbnail, right? Already or, done or that. that. Oh, it's all in yeah. one place already. And you could scan through these things and they're self-evident and you immediately get to that page that they're referring to, right? So you don't need to go download, scroll, et cetera. And it just seems so obvious on the one hand that we should all be moving there. But at the same time, I feel like it's a combination of a technology, but I also think it's a human oversight. And I'm like, let's dive. So we like it related to, we're obsessed with technology and we're like doing that, but let, let's not talk about us. Let's talk about like, why do humans work so hard I'm putting, build, writing that 80 pager, right? But spend relatively little time in that kind of like, how are, how is my audience going to consume it in a less friction way? And, and when I'm not talking just overall, like the big speech, but it's that care about the recipient seems somehow mm-hmm. to be missing, even in very people that may have prepared, like the overall communication may have been done pretty, pretty smart way. It it really comes down to that awareness and sensitivity to what it is that the audience needs and listening to what it is they're requesting and they're asking for. The You mentioned a, a couple of times scientists, and, and I work with a lot of scientists and physicians. And, and when I do, I say, I do not want to dumb down your science. I don't want to reduce 
the power of the innovation that you're putting out into the world. I just want to make it accessible to other people. And maybe that accessibility is an analogy or a patient story or a website where I can really see what the experience of somebody with a visual disability is having. But I want to look at ways to make your science accessible without dumbing it down, without reducing it. And once a leader begins to see that's the goal of communication is to make what they've been working on so long accessible to others, it's easier to have them look at what other channels should I be going through or, or how should I phrase this in a way that an educated layperson, that a, a prospective donor or funder who doesn't know the science can understand it and then want to engage with it more. So I think we, if we look at accessibility to our audience more than reduction of the nuance or dumbing things down, we will have more success with the people who, who are doing some really remarkable, innovative things. And some people would say that simplifying a complex idea is the hardest part about it. Yeah. What's your take and where, where are the resources? And I know we've talked about, share some authors that we love. Obviously, I, re, I enjoy your book and the frameworks that you're promoting yourself and others in a very simple interface. But what are some of the best ways in which people can get that complex message across? We've talked about Dwarty. I love Chip Heath and make, making ideas sticks. There, is there a book in particular that you think is great for people with complex and lots of information? Because I think the ones that have shallow information, those I'm not worried about those folks. <laughs> they're like they they're actually reading those books anyway, and they're like they're making they're filling us with a lot of things that maybe are not very healthy for the society as a whole. But the folks that have substantive ideas, like where would they turn to? There's two that immediately come to mind. Uh, Storytelling with Data by Cole Knopfleck. She's got a series of books now. She has a website. She has a podcast that are all uh, by that same name. I think is the most valuable way to look at accessibly making data available to an audience in a way that, again, drives action. I don't just want to inform you persuade you. I want you to take an action based on the data analysis that we've done. So she is who I would put at the very top. And then there's a book, the title of it is Brief. I want to say the author is McMaster. I'm struggling. We can put in the show notes exactly what it is, mm -hmm. but really good work about writing in a way that's concise and accessible that I don't have to read a five page email. I can read a three paragraph or a five paragraph email and understand what it is that, that you're writing about. So those are the two, one in visual communication, one in written communication that, that are very contemporary and that I would guide people to who wanna really, as you say, double click and dive into this topic. Those would be the two places I'd recommend. Let's say I didn't get a chance to be a student at Annenberg in the USC or one of your lectures at Stanford, and I wanted to get that pithy three takeaways that are brief about what I can do tomorrow to be better, let's say in visual communications, right? Like stuff that's probably increasingly becoming very, very important in our kind of modern post-COVID environment. So the three pithy items that I would offer, uh, first, know your aim. Go back to audience intent and message. Really map that out before you create slides or a memo or a presentation. Know your aim. Second, from a, a visual communication point of view, eliminate clutter. Anything that I can take off of the slide or off of the website so that my core message is clear and understandable is going to be a great step in the, in the right direction. Coco Chanel is reported to have said, when you get yourself dressed and you have everything, then remove one accessory so that really you become the essential element of yourself that you want to be out in the world. Same thing with anything that we design visually for communication is every time I eliminate something, I make what remains more powerful and more compelling. 
So it's like and that, then the third uh, piece was Saint Exupéry quote: "Perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away." Is exactly. that exactly? Kind of oh my yeah. gosh, you you pulled that up beautifully. Okay. And then the the third piece would be own the headline. So many times I look at somebody's PowerPoint slides and the header is a topic, not a headline. Financials, market cap, outlook. Right. That, that's a category. That's a topic, but that's not a headline that says financials are amazing. Outlook terrifies us. Put a verb up there and use the headline. So those would be my three. Know your aim, reduce clutter, and maximize your use of the headline. Great. Very applicable. And you now don't have one... to send me $90,000. It's, it's, right, it's there, all... there you go. <laughs> the crypto wallet is going to be the show notes. <laughs> so this is fantastic. Now, one of the things that we've talked about is that you have a diverse audience. And we're recording this during a Pride Month. Uh, and you've mentioned here and in public about your family and your partner and your kids. So tell us a little bit and whatever that you angle is of the diverse audience that you feel is appropriate. What does that mean today to be, to be respectful of diverse audience? And I'll tell you my particular challenge is I I'm Silicon Valley, like similar to yourself, but I also come from Ukraine originally. And so when it came to building our team, we were like building it in the let's be scrappy and virtual world. And so we have, we have some sensitivity of having folks from California like you, that, are, that live in that milieu. But then we have folks from Philippines, from Ukraine, folks that left Ukraine and now moving escape that. You have Brazil, right? The language nuances of English vary. Maybe developers don't need to have the full control that the marketers do. And it's an amazingly diverse environment, but it also creates challenges in terms of how do you define diversity? Is it is everybody going to have the same value set? And how do you bring everybody together and create a welcoming environment for everyone? And so I think about it a lot, right? It's a lot of bit easier to say if there's a like central cultural milieu that defines what it is. And so we have we're struggling in a good way to define it in our own, given our diverse environment. But any advice here for global organizations? What does it mean to create an inclusive communication for all the members of the community? It, it's a great question. And Alex, I'm really glad you asked whether it's June or not June. I think it's an important element for us to think through. And I guess I look at it on two sides of the coin. First, as a communicator, as a leader, I want to bring my full self to the conversation. And I wasn't outing myself. 20 minutes ago when I said my husband's a minister, I wanted to tell a story about his church and that was the best way to, to get there. But I didn't have to edit myself. I didn't have to slow down and think, ooh, can I say this in this right. moment? I am more authentic and more effective if I'm able to fully bring myself to the conversation. So as a leader, that's what I encourage people to do to the level at which they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. and, and different people have different choices there. Now, reversing the lens, thinking of the audience, I then also want to do what I can within reason to be sure that the audience sees themselves represented in the content that I'm sharing. And so when we talk about a global audience and diverse audience, I want to recognize that there are people who worship in different ways. There are people who use multiple languages. There are people who will, who will experience the content in a different way because of their worldview. And I want to do what I can to be sure that my content is, is as accessible to them in Ukraine as it is in Mexico City, as it is here in downtown San Francisco. And the reason I kept adding within reason because if I go too far down this pathway and I try too much to be all things to all people, I'm going to neutralize and ruin the content that I have to share. But if I do none of this and I deliver all of it from a, a, a white male mid 50s perspective, I'm going to also lose people. So you need to be thoughtful about it. Use examples. 
uh, use language, use images that show that you are inclusive, accepting Universal that your inclusive. audience is coming from multiple places. Yeah. And then depending on what your content is, how does it need to be tailored to be received in those different places? But when we go too far, when we over index on trying to appear diverse, I think we end up hurting ourselves in the long run. Because we can't be authentic. We can't be a... Yeah, because then you're no longer authentic and you're really pandering to to people rather than speaking authentically. Yeah, I really like that distinction. And I think the... I will just illustrate an example that just you, when you were talking reminded me when I was at Success Factor, we had the sales leader who I supported, Jay Larson, and one, one on one call, he said something very simple. He's, it was holiday season. We were like, everybody was working, but obviously Christmas was coming up. And he said something like, hey, and of course, Merry Christmas to all those celebrating. And that little addition to all those celebrating would have been inclusive to somebody who's Jewish or somebody who is an atheist. And it wasn't like saying, oh, we can't say Merry Christmas because like that also, that is extreme, right? And hey, if you're like in, in many countries, that is the, th- that actually is the only thing you would say. But this was actually a very, very kind of good way to acknowledge. Very thoughtful. Right, like very thoughtful without making it all feel, somebody feels bad oh, I'm a Muslim and I am not celebrating this particular holiday. And then we could do the same thing for around all the holidays, celebrating the diversity that, that we have. And so that was really interesting for me that, you know, you, you can still be authentic. Um, Absolutely. And Absolutely. without feeling, making people feel marginalized. One other one that's, uh, on the, I would say, drops into the sensitive times. And it's actually from a friend of, of yours, Daniel Markovitz. Who I just saw earlier today. Uh, Excellent. And I asked him, Daniel, what question would you like JD to respond to, to our audience? And he asked you, when you're communicating, how do you challenge a lie? And I think it's a great question because we live in a world that has many narratives thrown at you at once and thrown at all of us at once. What's What would be your answer? How Not do I challenge people? a lie? How do you challenge a lie? I appreciate that, that Dan sent in such a softball question for us to la- answer in the last minutes of the podcast. Um, Election season is coming comes, up in the United States. It, <laughs> it, it comes down to relationship to the liar and the lie. So if the lie is so strongly contrary to me, my experience, people I care about, companies I've started, then I will do everything I can to address it directly and make clear what my position is. Without being adversarial, like I I don't want to make it worse. I don't want to ratchet it up by screaming and yelling, and all of a sudden I have made it worse by my response. So directly and clearly, and I also look at my relationship to the liar, to the person who has shared this. If I have a huge commitment to that person and their development, I may want to really take some time, maybe individually, maybe in front of a group, to work through this topic, they may be uninformed. They may not have the same experience or worldview that I have. They may be somebody I'm not that invested in. Or if I do that, I'm actually just going to make it difficult on both of us and not change their mind. If it's a belief system rather than they said a company was founded in 1909. No, it was actually founded in 1919. I'll decide, is that something I need to go to work on or something I, I can let go? I want to be sure that as I respond to the lie, people know where I stand and I preserve the relationships in the room and the relationships that matter most to me. So I pay attention to both of those items as I respond to the lie. And it sounds like what you implied in there is also the magnitude of the lie, right? Because it could be a lie. It could be 
you could think it's a lie, but it may actually not be a lie. And, and so what you're saying is this is how close is it on the sort of spectrum of debatable lie, misunderstanding? And is that kind of what I'm hearing, like that nuance around this? And then the relationship is another layer that you add onto that. So it's Absolutely. Too like- I think both of those are important. And I'll add in the conversation we had a few minutes ago. Also the medium. I choose not to interact with people pretty much ever on social media around things that I see one way and they see another way. I'm not going to convert them. I'm not going to bring them around to my opinion. And I'm just going to either break the relationship or annoy other people by engaging there. And so I have a whole lot of people that are Facebook friends that are politically different than me, spiritually different than me, sexual orientation different than me. And I don't use Facebook to debate any of those topics with them. I share about my family. I will share this podcast with them. I will Mm. put things out there that I care about, but I won't engage as a a place to have an argument or a debate. If they really matter to me, I'll pick up the phone and say, hey, you know what, Brian? You you posted this the other day. And as somebody in recovery, here's my experience of of that. And here's how it landed for me. But I'm not going to do that on a Facebook post or on an X uh, reply because I'm not going to change any minds that way. And I I want to preserve those relationships. This is a fantastic insight into kind of how to live a health. It seems like a healthy life in the society that is getting easily. It's so easy to get polarized. And I think one of the things that I love that, again, back to your TED speeches, you're not afraid of tackling very sensitive topics, including self-harm. And this is something that you... Are st- you're still getting the messages out there. But I think one of the things that I love is that what you said, the, the message that you do on social media is about extending the care that the, that's less about promoting you and it's more about helping the audience of the message or people that the audience may know. So let's wrap up on that note. What kind of advice do you have for communicators to be bolder around sharing the things that are important to them and potentially to their audiences, because you're modeling that yourself, obviously. I think it's very much an inside job. I think you as a leader have to know where you stand and what is my intent in sharing this position with this audience at this point in time. I may choose to share a struggle with drugs and alcohol that that I overcame many years ago, Uh, a struggle with depression that I also overcame, the journey that I had as a gay man coming out in a small town in Western Kansas. Uh, Those are all parts of my identity and parts of my journey. And I may choose to share those in a conversation or a talk or a meeting, but I want to be clear, what's my motive in doing that? Am I doing it to make an opening to point people to resources, to allow people to share something they have struggled with, or am I doing it to win points, to gain attention, to make somebody else look bad? I really want to know what is my motive in sharing this? And is this the place for me to step forward and do that? And if I'm, if my motive's unclear, I remain silent. Or if I'm not ready to share that information with this group of people, I trust that inner voice and I wait. And maybe I go back a week later or a month later or five years later and say, I didn't feel comfortable telling you this at that moment, but I want you to know this part of me. Just because I choose to stay silent on an aspect of my journey in a given moment doesn't mean I can't ever go there. It just means in that moment, didn't feel right, didn't feel safe, chose not to do it. And that, that, all of that's an inside job. What's my motive? How comfortable am I? All of those before I put something out there that may be out there for a long period of time. JD, this is so much appreciated that you gave us a bunch of really practical playbook, playbooks and a lot of heart. How can our audience continue to get wisdom from you? I just want to pull this back up here. I love what you've done with my stuff. There's a great photo of a slightly younger JD Schramm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But yeah, the easiest way is my website, jdshram.com. 
I do a regular newsletter every two to three weeks. It's uh, chock full of tips and information about communication. I don't sell to my audience and I don't sell the names of my audience and I don't charge for my newsletter. So that's one of the best ways to create a sense of dialogue and connection. And I would love to have people check out my site, check out my newsletter. And if I can be a resource, happy to do. If I'm not the right resource, I've got a pretty good Rolodex and I can put you in touch with somebody who can help with a particular issue or topic in communication that any of your listeners or viewers are facing. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us, JD.